Hi, BioSci 102. This is Dr. Georgie. This is the first lecture on tissue culture. So this is a brief overview of TC, and you're going to dive more in depth in lab. And um, Toby Colston has prepared some really great lectures for you that you're going to read. This is a great place. This lecture is a great place to start. And then um, you'll see that uh, you'll go much more in depth. So this is just a very broad general overview about tissue culture. And what is tissue culture? It's growing cells in a lab. This is a picture of Cho cells, Chinese hamster ovary. As you can guess, it's taken with phase microscopy. I hope you can see the phase rings. The cells that are balled up are usually cells that are either dividing if they're attached or if they're floating up, they're um, possibly dead when they're floating. So you just tap the flask and you kind of see what jiggles. Um, the cells that are more stretched out are the cells just going about their regular business. You did a whole phases of mitosis lab. so. Uh, you know, those are interphase cells. And um, yeah, so here's an example of some cells that are happily growing in culture. Why do we do this? Well, it's often a better way to do experiments because we can rapidly test a number of variables on different flasks of cells. We can control the variables. Um, we like to start a lot of things in tissue culture and then see, you know, what comes out of that. See, for instance, which molecules um, can have an effect like stopping tumor cells from growing. And then we take it to animals and, you know, mice with tumors and see if those same molecules work in the mouse. And then we take them to humans. And so it's often a first step in development of pretty much anything you can think of, okay? Because once we are, have the ability to grow cells and culture in a lab, um, the number of experiments we can do and the number of questions we can try to answer is really enormous, infinite, I would say. So this is a great way to do experiments. And um, it also, and this is very important to a lot of us, saves the lives of a lot of animals because you need a lot less animals, hopefully someday maybe even um, none or certainly very few. Um, it also turns out to be a great way, even a better way in many ways to produce medicine. And that led to the biotech industry. And I'll talk about that briefly. So cell culture, the ability to grow cells in a lab has enhanced human life on this planet in many, many ways. And also uh, we use it not just for humans, but um, to answer pretty much any question in biology or not any question, but a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions we can answer using cell culture. So how do we do this? Well, we have media, we call it. It's basically the food, it's liquid food in its full of vitamins and nutrients and whatever that cell type particularly likes. Most cells also like a little bit of an FBS supplement, so about 10% is FBS. What is FBS? It's fetal bovine serum. Yes, serum, that's the part of the liquid part of the blood from um, baby cows from slaughterhouses. Um, so <laughs> people are trying to work away from that too. Um, but at the moment, it's basically, you're replacing blood, you're recreating blood because that's how cells um, grow is there, there's blood circulating in bodies and um, the blood turns into extracellular uh, fluid, but it's basically the idea is the cells are bathed in fluids. We all came from the ocean originally, where there was nice, this lovely salt water surrounding us. That's where cells were invented, so to speak. And <laughs> we carry that ocean inside of us as our blood. You'll notice that I'm being very mammalian centric. So that I'm talking mostly about what happens with mammals. Plants don't have blood. Um, Plants can be grown in a lab too. Plant tissue culture is a thing. And um, 
insect cells can be grown in a lab. Insect cell tissue culture is a thing also. Um, they are arguably easier than growing mammalian cells. We're gonna focus on mammalian cells, so cells of mammals, um, warm-blooded animals that have blood like us, including us, we're mammals. We're gonna focus on that partly because that's my background, but also because that's where a lot of the jobs are. However, it is possible to grow uh, plant cells, insect cells, et cetera, other types of cells too. And if you're actually trying to grow bacteria, then you're a microbiologist. So that's a whole different field, <laughs> right? Um, what else do you need? So you're feeding the cells this lovely food, this lovely liquid nutrition. And because they are mammalian cells that we're talking about mostly, you're gonna wanna keep them warm. Mammals have a body temperature that they regulate. Ours is 37 degrees Celsius. We also regulate our internal gases we breathe in and we have a whole system of how we regulate the gases that surround our cells and are in our cells. And if you um, have a gas imbalance, you might be dead. It's a quick way to die. <laughs> so in fact, it's, the, it's something that happens at all deaths. So it's connected to all deaths. Um, we, in particular, in tissue culture, we need to regulate the CO2 levels. That's the important gas because it affects pH of cells. And um, all deaths, according to all the nurses I've ever talked to, are basically acidosis or alkalosis. So the wrong pH, too high or too low a pH, and um, your body at some point can't recover from that. And why do you have that high pH or low pH? Because you know other things are going on with your system. So we are trying to keep cells alive usually. <laughs> Cell culture is pretty much frequently, um, how to put this, it's a fight against cell death, okay? So you're trying to keep cells alive and happy. You're trying to keep them with the right pH. You want the right temperature, toasty, warm, wet, just like they would be in the body of a mouse, a rabbit, a rat, a Chinese hamster, I guess, um, or a human. To grow the cells in the lab, one of the most important things you have to keep in mind at all times is how to perform correct sterile technique, which is formally known as aseptic technique, as in the formal name, not as in once upon a time. So aseptic technique slash sterile technique is a series of good lab practices geared around keeping the bacteria out of that delicious medium because they also like the warmth, the vitamins, the nutrients, the FBS. It's a great way to grow bacteria, but we're not trying to grow bacteria. We're trying to grow cells and we're trying to grow only cells like, you know, uh, Cho cells or um, any variety of mammalian cell lines. We're trying to grow the cell line we're trying to grow and we're trying to grow it without bacteria because bacteria will, um, well, change the pH and also basically take over. So you're not trying to do microbiology, <laughs> you're trying to do cell culture. And um, you're also trying to keep the fungi out. So there's a variety of fungus fungi um, that love all of this, the warmth, <laughs> the delicious media, and so on. So you're also trying to keep them away. And to do that, you have to be really aware of everything you do with your hands, everything you touch, every where everything you're using is, is air is more sterile than surfaces. And so you learn to move, you learn to work in a certain way that keeps your cells bacteria and fungus free. So no fungus, no bacteria. There are arch enemies. <laughs> we are trying to get rid of them and keep them away and not let them prosper. We want our cells to prosper, not the bacteria. This is why we have a huge horror of microbiologists. We don't want them even next door or anywhere in the building. Um, God bless the, I mean, sorry, 
Heavens bless the beautiful work that is done by microbiology, but please don't come near my TC room is the way we um, think of it. Having good sterile technique is one of those skills that pays off in terms of career opportunities and, um, you know, more pay, more money, et cetera. It's one of those key skills that makes you exciting to employers because it means that you can operate well in a lab, you have good hands, and you know a series of techniques that you have practiced that are incredibly useful to a wide series of industries, a wide series of situations. So this is something that you really want to dig into in as part of the class in lab and you want to get a good understanding of because the job opportunities are enormous. If you're good at um, tissue culture, you understand sterile technique and you can go into lab and just start working properly and not get things contaminated. It's hugely important. I find it really interesting that right now, because of the pandemic, people are starting to be more aware of a lot of the things that we talk about in a TC lab already. Like, don't touch the door with your gloves. Are you kidding me? Gloves are only for while you're working. Take them off when you leave. Um, you know, what is touching what? Um, there's an analogy to using glitter. Like if you have glitter on your fingertips, where is it going to be in 15 minutes? It's going to be everywhere you were plus more. So you kind of want to think of the bacteria as glitter and they're everywhere and you're actually trying to avoid it and you're trying to not get it into your media or your cells. And astonishingly, it is possible to do that. You're not in a complete sterile um, situation, but you're in a fairly sterile situation and you're doing your best. So there are things like clean rooms where the air is pumped out and you're in what's called a bunny suit um, when you're manufacturing um, electronics like uh, silicon chips and so on. That's the ultimate sterile technique. This is sort of a real life pretty pretty good sterile technique that you achieve in tissue culture labs. And you are basically doing most of your work in a laminar flow hood. So it's a special hood that creates a sterile working area and you stick your hands into it. Now your hands are in a different environment, um, in an environment that is mostly bacteria and fungus free. This type of hood, by the way, is different than a chemical hood. The chemical hood is about keeping the toxic vapors away from you. The laminar flow hood is about creating an air curtain between you and where your hands are doing the work with the cells because actually you're dangerous to the cells because you are full of bacteria and fungus and things that like to live on mammals, right? And so you're actually protecting the cells from you and yes, you're protecting you from the cells should the cells be something dangerous. Most of the cell lines we work with are um, not that dangerous, but occasionally there are situations where you need to be careful. So where is this happening? This is happening in all sorts of situations, including research labs in academia, where we're developing new um, solutions to healthcare, but also, you know, at a very basic level, but we're also just researching things out of curiosity, like what's up, what's going on, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is happening with life, let's ask a question and answer it. The biotech industry is literally the industry of cell culture, somebody said, wait, this can be used to solve um, problems of medicines, and we'll talk about that. So that's literally how it's defined. Why is it biotech? It's biotech because they're doing cell culture. Um, of course, other industries like agricultural industries use cell culture. So many industries, and in particular, especially right now and in the Bay Area, there's a lot of startups using cell culture techniques, including all these new lab-grown meats you may have heard about, or clean meats as they're now being rebranded. So um, there's a huge movement to replace the use of cows in our food with nutritious lab-grown uh, meat, basically, because we can grow muscle cells. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And that's, that's just a huge growth industry right now. There's lots of jobs in it. 
Okay, so who's doing this? Lab techs, grad students, postdocs, you. <laughs> so basically scientists everywhere. And um, that's the who, what, when, where, why, anyway, those five questions, the general overview of cell culture. Let's take a second to pause and think about cell types. So we're growing cells in a lab situation instead of in a body, bodies grow cells, right? So we're taking some cells out of a body or out of a plant, out of an organism and growing them in a lab situation. Well, the word cells is very broad and vague because just in the human body alone, there's over 200 and 30 now, 226, depends who you ask, but there's over 200 cell types just in our own body. So when I say I'm culturing cells, it's not enough to say I'm culturing cells. <laughs> what cells am I culturing? Every cell line is going to want its own particular recipe of delicious food and it won't grow with another recipe. It's gonna want, it's, it's, they're finicky in a certain sense. And in another sense, to be honest, they all are generically kind of doing the same thing, but the, sometimes the details are very important and you've got to dig down into the details. The generic concept is the same, feed them something good, um, something liquid, and <laughs> then you know keep them warm and keep them away from the bacteria and the fungi. So, just reflect for a second as we're talking about this on what you have learned in um, anatomy and physiology classes or just general biology classes. And if you haven't, go take a look out there. Um, there's tons of info about different cell types. So in our body, what are these 200 cell types? Well, there's adult stem cells. I mentioned those because they're having a day with um, stem cell medicine, which is known as regenerative medicine. Um, again, we're getting a lot of great answers from that field, from nature telling us, uh, opening nature secrets to us and saying, hey, you know what? You want to regenerate a part of, you know, a tissue or something? Here's how to do it. So it's an amazing time in history right now in terms of working with stem cells. That's its own giant, enormous field that includes embryonic stem cells, which can become anything, they're in the embryo, they become all parts of the body. And then there's different types of stem cells, including what we call adult stem cells, which are somewhat differentiated. So they've sort of picked a cell type, but they've picked a broad cell type. And out of that cell type, they can choose to become a variety of things. For instance, I have a picture here um, of a neuron. You know, it's uh, one of the cell types in your brain. And actually there's many types of neurons too. Um, I'll, so neurons and glial cells form your nervous system. And then we've got a picture and it's of course, the neuron is in fluorescence. And then in H and E stain, we've got a small intestine with some epithelial cells that are lining it, plus some secretory cells. There's some muscle down low. And if you're looking at this picture and going, I don't know what cell she's talking about. They're all pink and purple. Are they different cells? Um, good, you're perfect for biocyanine this summer. <laughs> Although actually you really want to start with anatomy beforehand and then you'll dive into um, the cell types. That's what histology is. It's the study of different cell types. And so you'll get to see a lot of great pictures. And by the end of bio, uh, BioSynine, you should be able to just look at these pictures and go, oh, I know exactly what these are. So there's muscle cells, there's epithelial cells, there's fibroblasts. I mentioned them because um, they're used a lot in cell culture. They're one of the original <laughs> sort of cell types that are very easy to grow. They're used to tough lives in the body because fibroblasts are secreting the uh, collagen and other um, proteins and other things like that that create some of the structure in the body. And so they're used to sort of living a tough life, if you will, they're tough little cells. Um, so there are over 200 cell types and the details of the cell culture vary, but the general rules and the general techniques are pretty much the same, whether you're growing neurons or epithelial cells or fibroblasts or anything else like that. Let's look at the history a little bit. Um, 
the lectures prepared by Toby Colston are uh, phenomenal. They give you some really good history. I've looked over the lectures and in a way I'm, some of what I'm done, doing here is just telling you some of the other stories. Um, so this is, I'm a cell biologist, that's my field, I study cells. And this is kind of the cell biologist version of key developments in the history of tissue culture or cell culture. Um, I have this on a later slide, but I can see that uh, I need to tell you right now, tissue culture and cell culture, are they different? Not really. As you can see, people like me um, and most people toggle back and forth between saying tissue culture or cell culture. It's just like whatever you wants, your mouth wants to say in that moment. And for some reason, most of us always abbreviate it as TC, not, and so like we pick tissue culture if we're gonna abbreviate it. I don't see people using CC as an abbreviation much. Okay, so coming back to the history of tissue culture or cell culture, whichever you wanna call it, in the 1950s, 40, late 40s, early 50s, um, we started to figure out how to do this. And notably, um, the first human cell line that still lives on literally to this day, um, their HeLa cells are still used everywhere. So the first human cell line was developed and it was, it was named HeLa cells after um, the wonderful woman, Henrietta Lacks, who, whose tumor actually um, provided the cells. And there's really interesting history around the bioethics of what happened that we'll delve into later in the semester. And, um, it would, and I would normally put her picture up, but since we're gonna have a whole lecture on, on that, um, you'll see that later. So I say she gave the cells, but she didn't know she was giving the cells and that's problematic. And um, she did pass away from the tumor and wasn't really acknowledged. Although the line was named after her, not a lot was said about her. And um, there's just been an a, a good recognition of her role. And uh, I kind of feel like she's one of the ancestors of this. I know it wasn't that long ago, but um, she's really important to those of us who do cell culture. Um, we're really grateful to, to her and the researchers too who developed that. So that really launched this whole field. Having HeLa cells, they're um, amazingly easy to grow. They're stable, they're still you know, growing and being used in labs um, even now. And once we realized we could do that, a whole series of other cell lines were developed and you're gonna investigate different cell lines um, in your lab next week. So in the 1800s, um, some local scientists decided, hey, <laughs> we should use this to produce medicine. So everybody was using cell lines, including Cho cells for research. And they said, these Cho cells are remarkably easy to grow. They are like super easy. They're sort of the training wheel cells, if you will, the easiest cells to start with. And um, they're remarkably kind of the same from, you know, week to week and so on. So they're great little cells that were just randomly developed. Um, People are just sort of fanning out and trying everything. Like, what, what can we get to grow as a cell line? Oh, wait, these Cho cells, look, <laughs> they're, they're the same every week. Every week I look at them and they're exactly the same, lovely. So a couple of scientists said, well, you know what? <laughs> right now, insulin is being produced by killing pigs and mashing up their, um, their pancreas. And that's a long way to do it. And it's also, I mean, it's expensive, it's inefficient, there's a limited supply. And also the way that pigs um, modify their proteins, um, it's not exactly the same. So it's not really bioidentical insulin to human insulin. So we can do better. We can get the Cho cells to express the insulin. In other words, we're gonna genetically modify the Cho cells by giving them the gene for insulin. And they're gonna produce some insulin that they secrete outside into the fluid that we're feeding them. And so all we have to do is just, you know, scoop up the fluid, it's so easy. And um, it worked. <laughs> Genentech was the first biotech company. 
and it started producing cheaper, better insulin, and it revolutionized the world, it revolutionized human lives. It is still a beautiful company to work for. It has many products. It gave birth to the biotech industry right here in the Bay, um, in the Bay Area, and in South San Francisco, where it still is. It's kind of its own little small country right now. <laughs> it's huge. And there's another at least 800 biotech companies in the Bay Area and uh, more throughout the world. So biotech was born here. It's still, you know, one of Silicon Valley and biotech are, are two great contributions to the world. Um, and there's tons of jobs. So get to know the biotech industry. It's a really exciting place to work. And the whole idea behind biotech is we're going to use cell culture to create the medicines. Before, medicines were created by chemistry. So there are chemists who worked in the pharmaceutical industry and the pharmaceutical companies were creating medicines through, you know, the use of chemistry, basically. Biotech is technically anytime you create um, medicine with cells. And those two were sort of rival industries. So biotech and pharma in the early days were kind of like pharma was like, wait, wait, we produce the medicines. And biotech, they were the upstarts. They're like, no, there's a better, different way to produce medicine. Here we come. We're young and hungry, <laughs> as uh, the Hamilton rap goes. Uh, that's a musical, by the way. So anyway. Uh, biotech in the early days was kind of against, was, you know, the threat to pharma. And then pharma said, wait, you guys are doing good work and just what, had more money, bought out all the biotech companies, including actually Genentech is owned by the pharmaceutical company called Roche. And these are huge multinational corporations often um, kind of headquartered in uh, Switzerland for tax reasons. And uh, fortunately, when Roche bought out Genentech, they, were, they said, oh, no, we won't change it. And they haven't changed it too, too much. OK, so um, around the, in the 1980s, when things were taking off, um, one of the first easiest type of cells to grow were muscle cells. Muscle cells also really love being grown in a lab. There's a lot of cell types that we can't for any amount of media or any amount of trying, we can't get them to grow outside of a body. But muscle cells, fibroblasts, there's certain cell types that are just like, sure, put me in a lab incubator. I'm happy, just give me my media, no problem. I will grow, I will do mitosis, I will make more of me, no problem. Muscle cells, super easy to grow. They actually connect up and start beating, um, even just in a little tissue culture plate or flask. Um, we've known how to grow them for a long, long time. Right now, what's happening is uh, people have been working for decades on figuring out, okay, we got the muscle cells. That's basically meat. <laughs> so can we get, do they taste good? <laughs> Are they safe to eat? Um, and the answer was no, they don't taste good because the what gives meat its taste isn't just the muscle cells. It's actually the fat and the blood and the extracellular matrix and you know the collagen, the tendons, things like that. It's the whole tissue, not just the cell, just one cell type. Finally, recently, people have figured out ways to grow not just muscle cells, but muscle tissue. And that's basically the new startups um, that are doing an amazing amount, uh, just amazing success, I would say, in terms of trying to replace meat um, that comes from directly from animals with meat that is grown in the lab. So, you know, at most you have to kill one cow once and then you can just keep going um, with indefinite amounts of meat to feed the planet for a long time. Okay, so that's a big revolution that's happening literally right now, and it's changing from year to year. You can look up impossible foods beyond meat and Memphis meats. Those are the three big leaders in the field. Um, one of them is actually replacing meat by using straight out plant cells and making it taste like meat. The others are growing meat, but without animals. So cruelty-free meat. And again, lots of jobs in that field if you're interested. It's nothing but a growth field right now. So about 20 years ago, 
Um, Shinya Yamanaka, who's up there um, to your left um, with the microphones, accepting his Nobel Prize, figured out how to grow stem cells from somebody's skin. This is insane that we can do this. Okay. So we have all these cell types. We know that, you know, there's an embryo cell type that can become anything, infinite potential. But as the organism develops, then things kind of get firmed up and a cell has its identity. And it says, well, I'm a neuron. That's who I am. That's what I do. That's my shape. That's my structure. I have the neuron proteins. I don't have the proteins necessary to secrete acid or something like those cells in the stomach do. Um, so cells pick what's called a cell fate and they have a cell identity. And we always thought, well, for the longest time, you can't reverse that. Once something's a neuron, it's a neuron. You can't turn it back into the original full of potential state. It's kind of like saying somebody is retired from their career at age 80, and you're going to turn them back into a 20-year-old who's never worked a day in a lab or something like that. Like, no, you can't go back in time. Um, well, actually, you can with cells, <laughs> as it turns out. So uh, skin cells are... Uh, pretty distinct cell type that has a very strong identity. And um, this guy in his lab managed to turn them back, turn back the clock and turn them into what's called undifferentiated cells. So cells that are able to become a lot of cell types. In fact, um, they're, we're able to get them to go back to this, it's called a pluripotent stem cell. So it's a stem cell that can become some things, not all things, but many things. And the many things include neurons and epithelial cells. So the lining of the uh, smooth intestine and the neuron that I just showed you previously could have come from somebody taking a few cells from your skin and then doing some genetic um, manipulation on them you only have to this is stunning you only have to change four genes and then they go to this sort of state in cell culture in the lab of just being round and you know undifferentiated nothing special they're just like this generic cell and then you can convince them to turn into neurons or uh, muscles or epithelial cells or so on so again um you know, something really revolutionary <laughs> that has kind of been blowing our minds as scientists and continues to be an amazing uh, development. A lot of um, what motivated him at the time was politically, um, there was a lot of resistance to using, um, uh, well, embryonic stem cells, we get them or we got them. <laughs> from uh, aborted embryos, human embryos. And so for, I think, obvious reasons, a lot of people are like, we don't, you know, we don't want you doing that um, for a variety of reasons. And so Shinya said, you know what, what we want is cells that we can turn into different things so that we can grow different kinds of cells and we can study how they become a cell and we can learn so much from them and we can test out different medicines and, and so on. Just again, the whole idea is to ask a lot of new exciting questions. Um, and he had this crazy idea that, you know, he could take skin cells and turn turn back the clock and convince them to de-differentiate and um, nobody would fund him. And um, if you get to, I think in his noble acceptance talk, he talks about this struggle where he kind of almost lost his career. And then he kind of was doing something else, but he had four students who were amazing and willing to work on his crackpot idea that turned out in his case to be true and uh, changed the world. So um, as you can tell, I like these underdog stories in science because I don't know, they're just kind of interesting. There's a lot of people who, by the way, have a crackpot idea and never turns out to be true. You just don't hear about them. They just spend 30 years struggling. Um, but speaking of another, you know, sort of uh, against the grain person, in the 1980s, there was over here on the right, you see a picture of her, there's this fabulous Persian scientist. She would like, being called fabulous. She's uh, full of vim and vigor and just, um, she's great if you ever get a chance to hear her in her lecture, she's amazing. She's a breast cancer specialist um, and she was studying breast cancer cells. And she said, well, this is ridiculous. I'm studying 
uh, breast cancer cells on a dish and they're all flat. You know, they're, this is what we call 2D. And of course there's three dimensions to them, but there's just a layer of cells. In the actual breast tissue, they're in, they've got a shape. <laughs> they've got, um, they, they form these um, like grape-like shapes, basically, um, these nice little round shapes um, to secrete milk. And how can I get them to look like that as I'm growing them outside of a body? Um, and these were both human cells. Actually, her seminal paper on this, or like key paper, was I think human. Yeah, it was human um, cells. And she used fluorescence microscopy, of course, a confocal. So how, her, she said, how can I get them to grow in a more realistic fashion where I can study the 3D architecture and how they interact in real life? And she figured it out by basically um, providing them with not just the media with vitamins and so on, but also some basically collagen. <laughs> so there's this extracellular matrix goop by her own words um, called matrigel that she developed that is just a lot of collagen and other stuff that um, she comes from a certain process and it's sort of nonspecific, but if you toss it into the mix with the cells, the cells will suddenly ball up and turn into these little balls, just like in real life. And that was the first sort of emergence of 3D um, cell culture. And she, she was making a point with it, which is an important point in science, saying that the cell identity is determined by its surrounding. So if you take a cell and put it in a certain environment, it will know what kind of cell it needs to be by reading the message in the environment. And at the time, this was actually quite discounted. It took her a mere 15 years to, <laughs> to prove it and to be listened to. And um, and then have a fabulous career. She's in the Bay Area over at LBL Lawrence Berkeley Labs. And, um, you know, because the ECM, the extracellular matrix, is the collagen and other fibers that remain even when the cells aren't there in our body. So our cells uh, in our body are renewed at different rates depending on what cell they are. In your stomach, the cells like have a three day lifespan. In your bones, they're there for most of your life. But then there's other, the material that they build that surrounds them that gives the tissue a little bit of structure and shape actually persists even when the cells are gone. And that tends to last forever, except as we know, things like collagen break down more over time in our skin, we get wrinkles, so on. Um, so this, it was sort of like saying that uh, there's writing on the walls literally of a room and you come in, you know, so there's instructions in the ECM and you walk into the room and you read the walls and you go, oh, I, I need to be this kind of a cell. And, um, and it turns out that's true. That's how your body works. The previous cells leave instructions to the next cells. Okay, so that's a little side um, track. By the way, I tell you these stories to add some info and background and context. Uh, when I'm going to quiz you, I'm going to quiz you on what's written uh, down. So that's the things you need to know. And I won't ask you about Shinya and Mina, but that's just to give you some idea that all of these advances are done by actual scientists, um, usually working in teams. And sometimes when you know they have a clear voice or sort of clear leaders, we re can remember them also. Um, they're the ones who get the grants, right? Um, and give the talks. So behind each of these people, there's a, there's lots of students, there's lots of postdocs, there's lots of lab techs um, that make up the lab that produce the work. Okay, so on this uh, key development history, right now in the nows, <laughs> I don't know the 2020s, but I guess in the last 10 years or so, it's hard to say quite when. Um, there's been a steady development of this um, ability to grow cells, not just sort of flat on your flask, but in 3D clumps that have a structure that resembles the organ they came from. And sometimes even with blood vessels, which is pretty astonishing, um, then it's two cell types collaborating. So we call these organoids and it's a huge growth area again, um, there are many brain organoids that people are growing all over the place. This is a thing, little bits of neurons forming up into a little tiny brain. It's pretty 
not, it's an undifferentiated. It's not got quite the structure of a real brain, but it's several types together, you know, and um, if you're going to study a brain, it's a better way to study a brain than just a couple of cells, you know, far apart from each other. There's little mini hearts that pump. There's a little mini pancreases. Um, there's a research lab that is taking, um, P so cells from people with pancreatic cancer and turning them into organoids so they can quickly test which chemo drugs might be best for that particular individual patient um, with an eye towards saving the person because um, pancreatic tumors grow really fast and you don't have time to try different rounds of chemo. So that's just one example of many things that people are doing uh, studying organoids and you you too can get a job um, growing organoids. If you get a chance to do an internship uh, or get your first job growing organoids, it's a highly marketable skill because um, it, they are finicky. You have to really know what you're doing, but um, there's a gathering body of knowledge where we're getting towards better reproducibility and it's becoming sort of a standard thing. And um, there's been some labs that have been growing bladders, for instance, they actually 3D print the bladders <laughs> using cells as replacement organs. So this, this brings up, um, so this is of course so that we can study things, but also it brings up the whole issue of, can we grow replacement organs in a lab? Um, we do a pretty good job with skin for burn victims, actually. That's a thing that people have been working on for quite a while, but can we grow kidneys? Can we grow a pancreas? Can we um, you know, grow a heart? Uh, right now, uh, we, we kind of do have replacement heart parts and replacement hearts and so on. Ask me about it. I'll, I'll go into it in more details, but we're not quite from, we actually start with hearts of other animals. Um, and we actually, we leave behind the ECM and then we throw on human cells. And uh, so that's something in development. It's a really interesting time in history, you guys, because there's a lot of um, huge advances that really challenge our whole idea of like, who are we? And can we just grow replacement organs for ourselves? Should we do that? Um, is that a great idea or is it like the worst idea we've ever had? Um, so it's up to you to think about this because you will be working in this field and all, and you can be part of it and you can, you need to always have an eye towards, you know, what's the big picture? Am I working towards something that I believe in or um, am I passionate about this? You know, no more killing of cows. Let's make that happen. Or is this something that I don't think is a good idea? <laughs> so vote against it and don't work for that company. Um, so coming back to the practical side of this, how do you do TC? How do you do tissue culture? Well, there's fundamentally three things that you do. You feed the cells. Depends on the cell type. This is basically changing out their media. It's removing what's there, giving them some fresh media because they've kind of used up most of the good nutrients. Um, some cells like to be fed every two or three days. Other cells like to be fed about once a week. It's somewhere in that range. And um, they, they are actually putting out their own molecules into the media, including something known as growth factors. And it's basically instructions to each other to keep growing. And then when they, when they run out of space, they'll quit. They'll send out different instructions. And so you don't want to just feed them every day. You want to let those growth factors, their messages accumulate in their media. And they like to be, um, you know, kind of close to each other. You don't want to start with too few cells. You don't want to end up with too many. That's all a consideration. So you've got to actually think about how often you feed them. And I got to tell you, when you work in a TC lab, your time's not your own. Um, you have to do whatever the cells tell you to do. It's like an easier version of having a, a toddler or something. I mean, it's this is easier than a toddler is what I'm saying. Um, but they've got their own rhythm. And if you don't feed them when they need to be fed, then they're going to up and die on you. <laughs> and, and you'll regret it, basically. So you have to know yourselves. There's a lot of going in just for an hour on a 
you know, late at night to feed your cells, that kind of thing when you work with cells um, or, you know, work in a team and you just have to make sure they get fed when they need to be fed. When they're ready to be split, um, it, so then you have to go in and split them. And that's just a slightly more elaborate version of feeding them because uh, what you're doing is breaking them apart and then transferring them from, let's say, one flask um, to two flasks. So your cells, you're feeding them, you're feeding them, and they're just going to keep dividing and growing until they've taken over the whole bottom of your flask. At that point, you're looking at on, on the microscope, on the face scope, and you're like, aha, uh -huh, they're ready to be split. And you're going to take all the cells from that flask. You're going to get them to come off of the bottom of the flask and get them up in solution. And then you're going to divide them into, let's say, two flasks. That's a one to two split. Or you're going to divide them into four flasks. It's one to four. You're going to divide them into 10 flasks. You're kind of living on the edge there. <laughs> they might not make it if you, if you dilute them too much in the new flasks. Um, but that splitting cells or, and this is the same exact word, uh, I mean, means the same thing, you're passaging them. So that's a passage. You have just split them and the passage number goes up. They were passage 12. Now you've taken that flask and split it into two flasks. Um, both of these flasks are less populated and you're gonna, now they're both the next passage number. I've already forgotten what I said. So if it was passage 12, they're now passage 13. The new flasks have less cells in them, and so there's room for them to spread out and grow and divide, and you're feeding them every couple of days, and then maybe once a week, you passage them. There, this is where the lab math comes in. It's so important because you are always figuring out what their growth rate is, and when am I going to need to passage them? And you're also trying not to passage them at midnight on a Sunday night or Saturday night or something. You're trying to set them up so you can passage them on a Friday and then come back and feed them on a, a Monday. Uh, but, you know, that may or may not work. So lab math is your friend in trying to control your life. Um, and you also are like, usually you're, you're kind of like, I have scope, the scope time reserved on Monday, so let me make sure I have enough cells to image. Or of course, if you're producing drugs, then it's um, math times a million. It gets even more complicated and, and you have to be very precise with it. So uh, what else can you do with cells? So every so often um, you freeze them down. So they're basically in low cryo vials in uh, liquid nitrogen and you can, you keep them and you can pop them out when needed. So freeze thawing cells is a whole little technique. You may have heard about it with IVF. It's one of the reasons, for instance, um, it's, uh, they say, they tell women to freeze eggs earlier in life because, um, when your eggs are a particular kind of cell that is happens to be kind of hard to freeze down. The techniques were really similar to when we're freezing cells down. You just put some glycerol and stuff like that um, and, and you freeze them, uh, you do a quick, uh, you freeze them down through steps and try to do it quickly. Um, eggs get damaged by the freeze thaw process. Sperm don't. So that's why they're, you know, you may have, been told or people have uh, said, you know, if you're going to freeze eggs, you freeze them down when you're younger because you have more of them. And if there's damage, you have more to work from. If there's damage, there will be. People are working on that because we need better freezing and thawing techniques for eggs. Now, the cell lines that we use in uh, tissue culture labs, on the other hand, have been pretty much chosen because they can we can freeze them down easily and thaw them out and they're just fine. They're just happy as clams. And so this is a way to have a stock of cells. This is a way to um, take a break if you need to go away for two weeks or something, you freeze your cells down, come back and thaw them out. Um, there's ATCC, uh, which is American type uh, cell culture. It's an institution that has frozen down lots and lots of cell lines. So if you accidentally kill all your cells, <laughs> you can replenish them. Um, that way. Okay, so these are basically the three tasks that you will do, and they all involve aseptic technique. So you're going to feed the cells pretty regularly. Every so often, you're going to passage or split them. Same thing, passage slash split them. And then once in a blue moon, you will freeze or thaw them down. 
you're going to do all of that in the hood using aseptic technique. So here's my slide on, is it tissue culture or cell culture? Tissue culture technically should be, you know, more than one cell type. That's a tissue. Um, cell culture sh should be cells. So for instance, organoids, probably tissue culture. But in reality, they're used quite interchangeably. I shouldn't say somewhat interchangeably. They're used very interchangeably, and it's all the same techniques and equipment. So if you're working in a small lab, your cells are growing in a flask like this. That's the nutrient media that you're seeing. You can't see the cells with your eyes. You have to put them on a microscope, usually a face scope, to see them. Um, it's red because there's a pH marker in there that's um, put there on purpose to tell you uh, how's the pH going? Is it killing your cells or are your cells doing just fine? Uh, we say happy cells. So are your cells happy? That's a great color and it looks like happy cells. The neck of the flask um, is probably a little bit open. It has some air holes to let the air come in and out. And that's the home for the cells basically. And you are dealing with flask. That flask is about the size of your hand or a little bit bigger in that general range. And that is what you're manipulating, where you're growing the cells, you're adding the media, removing it, and so on. If you're working in a biotech company, it's not just a, you know, a few million cells and, a, and some flasks, or even 20, 30, 50, 100 flasks. Like startups, you might um, work with hundreds of flasks. I actually got a job once doing exactly that. I had probably, yeah, hundreds of flasks every day that I was feeding, basically. Um, but if you want to go bigger scale than that, you get these big bioreactors. I will admit, I don't know if this, uh, the, these are tissue culture bioreactors. My computer crashed. I had to remake this, <laughs> this lecture really fast today. So, but if they're not for tissue culture, the TC ones look kind of like this. And in fact, in Genentech, there's these enormous vats that you, um, you know, like the size of a small house that you have to walk out on scaffolding and control. And the job that goes with running these things, it's called biomanufacturing. This is literally making things using biology. And um, Laney has a great program in this. If you're interested in that side of things, there are tons of jobs in biomanufacturing. It, it is booming. Biomanufacturing includes making the people who are making the COVID vaccines. So as you can imagine, I'm pretty sure they're hiring right now. <laughs> okay. The struggle. What are the struggles in tissue culture? Um, also, I'm going to back up really quickly. Biomanufacturing includes biotech, which is tissue culture, and it includes biomanufacturing the vaccine. But the, what we're doing with the vaccine is not tissue culture. We're not growing cells and feeding them. It's a different process. But again, like anything, the once you know the general basic tenets of how to do good biomanufacturing, you can you know, sort of produce anything because it's similar. A lot of it is keeping track of the notes um, and then you know, other general things. Okay, so coming back to the struggle in tissue culture, what is the struggle? Um, well, one of the struggles, there's many struggles. <laughs> um, one, you know, including, oh my gosh, my cells, I need to split them, I don't have time. Okay, I've gotta make time. It's a common struggle. So timing things, making sure you did the math right, those kind of things are uh, sometimes a struggle. The big struggle though, as I mentioned before, is making sure the bacteria are not growing and also all the various fungi that wanna grow. So um, making sure you're growing the cells you want and not the uh, bacterial cells that you really don't want. The other, another struggle is that not all cell types are happy to grow outside of an organism. So there's a lot of cell types we still can't grow in cell culture. And, um, you know, if you're the one to figure it out, you will do a lot of good for humanity and for science. Another big struggle is how real are they really? Because <laughs> they there are cell lines like Cho cells and some fibroblast cell lines that have pretty much turned into what I call lab rat cell lines. Like, are they a rat that could survive out in the wild? No, <laughs> they're a rat that's used to food on you know a regular basis. And um, so none of these cell lines would survive on their own actually without a scientist. But um, they, they are, 
used to growing in labs and some of them have been growing in labs for decades. And so have they turned into this sort of generic cell that is not real to any actual cell? And is the information they're giving us actually um, specific to them? Or is it something that can translate into the rest of the world and other cell types? And it's something to keep in mind. You'll notice that in literature, a lot of times people just say, um, I'm growing cells. And my question as a cell biologist is always, which cells? <laughs> like that, you know, cells are different. <laughs> Depending, you can't ask certain questions of certain cells because they don't do that function. And um, it's a struggle, basically. It's something to always keep your eye on. It's why people are working on developing organoids because they're getting answers that are closer to the ultimate answer we want, which is how are things happening in a body and what can we do about it if there's, you know, if it if it's off balance, if it's a disease, um, what can we do to um, rebalance the body? So that's, you know, some of the struggle. Here's another question. How did you get the cells? So Originally, all of them came from a real organism at some point. And um, often if it was a bunny or a mouse or a rat or a Chinese hamster, um, it was killed. Um, it is no longer alive. Um, if it's humans, we, you know, kind of condone the killing of a human just to get, get some cells from them. So if it's human tissue, it probably came from um, some a biopsy or tumor surgery or some other surgery, any number of surgeries. Um, a surprising amount of labs work uh, using foreskin cells because there's a good supply of them and they love to grow in labs. So we've gotten a lot of answers um, to science questions from them. Um, abortions, um, babies are not aborted for scientists, but some of their tissue has been used in research labs to ask questions. Um, it's kind of difficult to and uh, unpopular to get those um, tissues. Uh, you'll notice that you have to coordinate with a surgeon or a surgery center because the cells, like if you're getting them straight from the human or from the surgery, you can't be too far away um, from the surgeon. But there's a lot of great research that happens rather than throw out the cells, let's use them. But thanks to uh, Henrietta Lacks's family actually, and there's a lot of consent and people are asked, they can't just take your cells and use them anymore. Um, so umbilical cords are great for getting cells that can actually turn into a lot of things. Those are pluripotent cells in there and the placenta tissue also um, is sometimes used in research. So you can see I'm reading the list off from the primary cell line. So a primary cell line is basically cells that come directly from the organism and usually they survive a few passages. And these are very exciting cells to do research on because they're going to be really what they really are. <laughs> you know, the, that gallbladder tissue is, you know, gallbladder tissue and you're growing cells from it. I actually don't know if you, I haven't heard of gallbladder cells, so maybe they don't grow well. But um, you're, you're doing, honestly, most of this is just um, early stages research because you don't have a consistent supply of these cells, but um, you're doing some really exciting work usually if you're working with primary cell lines or in labs, um, there's labs that you know, grow mice so that they can be used um, to generate primary cell lines. Most of us work on secondary uh, cell lines that are also known as immortalized. They're immortalized in the sense that they keep growing for decades. <laughs> you can keep just feeding them, they grow, they outgrow their flasks. So you're gonna give them two new flasks to take over and you're gonna keep growing. They're just gonna grow, grow, grow. Um, and uh, so they're adapted to the ongoing lab continuous uh, lab life and indefinite, we hope, passaging. Though we usually like to work with low passage number cells because they're a little maybe less transformed and you know more uh, original. You get all sorts of weird things happening. A lot of the pictures you may see with fluorescence microscopy have cells that have two nuclei. That's that's lab cells. That's a sign they've been in the lab too long. When you don't really see primary cell lines or actual tissue where you have cells with two nuclei, except for of course 
muscle cells on purpose have many nuclei, but every other tissue type has one nucleus. So that's a quick thing you can sort of insta spot like, oh, that's a, that's a cell line. It's been around for a while. It's got either big fat nuclei or two of them. You can see sometimes where there's a lot of variation in cell size. There's a little one next to a big one, so on. That's probably some sort of cell line that's been around for a while. Where do you get them? You get them from another scientist almost always, <laughs> because as you're doing tissue culture, you're always generating extra flasks, extra cells, because you want to have a backup in case something gets infected. So you're always on purpose making more than you need. And then you're always often throwing away a lot. Um, and so if somebody asks you for a flask, you're like, sure, but, uh, you know, I'd rather give it to you than throw it away. So we all trade cell lines. It's a very easy thing to get from other scientists. And uh, you can put them in CO2 and drive them across town if you need to in a little you know, like put some dry ice. <laughs> okay, that's if you get a um, some frozen cells. So we have done that at Merit. Um, we get them from UCSF or scientists at Berkeley or whatever. Not so not the actual living cells, but the ones that are frozen down. You put them on dry ice. You drive them over to Merit, and then you warm them up and put them in the hood, and um, they're happy and they grow. Another place you can get them is from ATCC, which I've talked about before, which has frozen stocks, and you're going to investigate that in lab. They're uh, shockingly expensive, so that's the main reason people don't get them from ATCC. Um, but they're great. They've undergone a lot of quality controls and things things like that. You can imagine that as uh, scientists are passing cells around to each other, the cells are kind of evolving and changing. And so it's a thing in science to kind of, where people kind of avoid talking about it, you know, like, are my MDK, MDCK cells the same as your MDCK cells? Um, and sometimes you get totally opposite results because they aren't <laughs> they evolved to be something different uh, in my hands or I feed them more often or I give them different media and so on. So a lot of exciting breakthroughs actually come from people who take good notes about the cells they are growing. Here's one of the best examples. Um, so and I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the scientist, but her lab was growing, again, breast um, tumor cell lines, which are quite easy to grow. Interestingly enough, cancer cells, slow growing, most of them, but tough, and they do well in, um, unfortunately tough, um, but good for science in that they do well in a lab. And so her lab was growing a variety of um, tumor cell lines, uh, breast cancer tumor cell lines, and they were studying what um, converts something into becoming the tumor type. And they had markers for that. So they had regular breast cancer cells and then they were getting them to become, to act like and be like tumor cells. And then one day all of their cells, even their controls, the ones that weren't tumor cells started being tumor cells <laughs> and they couldn't get regular cells. They could only get tumor cells. And they spent months trying to figure out what is causing all my cells to suddenly act like tumor cells? <laughs> I'm growing them in exactly the same tissue culture flask. Um, Corning supplies a lot uh, of the flasks. It's uh, Thermo Fisher and Corning are kind of all the supplies for the whole country, the whole world really, for tissue culture. And so they were using all the same stuff that they used. They checked the media, they checked the FBS, they checked everything. They were getting desperate. They started checking the plastics that they were using, the test tubes um, that they were using. And it turned out that Corning had just changed the formulation of their plastic test tubes to make them a little harder. It had put BPA in there. You may have heard of BPA. <laughs> um, basically, the plastic that they were using was causing their cells to become tumor cells. They discovered the presence of um, estrogen mimics in plastics. So this is why you're now told don't microwave plastics. Don't um, 
you know, don't drink from things that have BPA in them. Basically, we're all getting these estrogen mimics through our exposure to plastics, and it has uh, serious health effects um, on us as humans. And it was discovered because somebody was paying close attention and taking good notes while doing uh, tissue culture. Okay, so how do the cells grow? They grow as uh, adherent cell lines. If they stick to the bottom of the flask or a surface like a glass slide, you can grow them on glass slides and then image them and so on. There's various things that you can grow them in, uh, mostly not plastics with BPA because you know we just learned that they will uh, make your cell decide to be a tumor cell. Unless that's what you're trying to do, in which case bring on the BPA and other things like that. So there's a whole series of related chemicals that are used in plastics to make them harder that um, basically act as hormones um, to human cells. Okay, so alternately, you can grow the cells just floating, free floating in the media. That's called suspension cell lines or suspension growth. And as I said earlier, in tissue culture, your goal in life is to keep happy cells. And you might say, oh, Dr. Georgie just says it that way because that's her personality. It would be, I would probably say it anyway, but I happen to get a kick out of the fact that pretty much every scientist ever talks about happy cells because that's really how you think about it. You're like, what, you know, I want my cells to be happy. Um, this is a little ad from a company, you know, uh, embracing that. Good research starts with happy cells. And what do we mean by happy cells? We mean they are well fed, right, with the right nutrients. They are warm to the temperature they like, which is often 37 degrees. Insect cells prefer room temp, 23 degrees Celsius. Um, do they have the right pH? So that's the gas balance, basically. Um, too high a pH or too low a pH and it's toxic and they're stressed. We also talk about cells being stressed and we can look at cells and there's markers, there's physical markers um, where we can kind of just look at a cell and say, oh yeah, that's a line stressed. You can see them all crumpled up. You see these little, these blebs that come out of them that if you look through Professor Colson's lectures, there's picture, there's great pictures in there about all of this. Um, are they, are they at the correct confluence? So confluence refers to the percent of surface that's covered by the cells in the case of an adherent cell line. So um, there's a lot of cell lines that need a little bit of a crowd for them to exist. Otherwise they die of loneliness, so to speak. So you have to have like 20 to 40% of the surface covered when you first uh, plate the cells, as it's called, when you first put them down. Again, this is where lab math gives you the power to know how to keep your cells happy. So are they, you know, 20 to 40 percent confluence? Okay, they're happy. If they're only 10 percent, um, they, they're, they're too lonely, they're too far apart, they're not going to be able to secrete enough growth factors to keep each other alive, they'll just wither away and die off. If they're too confluent, they might start changing. They might start climbing up the walls or climbing up each other, or just sometimes they just go into a, okay, we're not growing mode. Um, and that may be what you want and maybe not what you want. It depends on what you're studying. But they're very sensitive to how many other cells there are and are they touching, are they stretching, are they you know, kind of running out of space, what's going on? Um, so since they're sensitive to it, you need to pay attention to it and you need to bring um, your math brain into the lab with you. And uh, of course, you're trying to make sure that they're not being outcompeted by bacteria eating all their food and changing the pH and attacking them even. So there's no contamination. This is kind of what you spend a lot of your time thinking about if you're doing cell culture. Um, are my cells happy? Are they free from contamination? Are they the right amount of cells? Do they look the right size, the right shape? Do they look happy or are they stressed? And you also very much keep notes, take pictures, do drawings so that you have a record of basically, if you will, the mood of your cells. <laughs> but the, you know, how happy were your cells is actually a very important thing for quality control and for understanding the science that is happening with your cells. 
that's it. Have fun in lab and enjoy Professor Colston's phenomenal lectures that dive into this in greater depth.